Hello, we are back. All right. It has uh, been long enough that uh, Joffrey Baratheon, the usurper, has been replaced uh, with Torin the wildling. Torhan the wildling? <laughs> yes. Do you, Looks like a Star you watch Wars you watch character. Game of Thrones at all? Most definitely. Most you do. Okay. Is that Obi Wan Doctor Kenobi? C it's not Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> it's a wildling. Okay. You have not seen Game of Thrones. No. Right. I'm aware there's a so, thing called Game of Thrones. There's a thing. You're aware. <laughs> it's like Lord of the Rings, right? Oh uh, yes. I'm just, <laughs> just basking in just my nerddom here. Uh, seething with rage. Seething. <laughs> Welcome okay. back. Uh, we have uh, this is uh, Brain Pods Volume Ten. We are rolling right along here. We have uh, finished uh, peripheral neuropathy. We're now down to the uh, neuromuscular junction and uh, uh, myopathies. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Asadi, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. All right. So hello again, everybody. Uh, just starting. So goals outline intro going to look very similar to the last lecture so again we want to introduce a reasonable number of the many 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 uh, disorders that are out there for this type of, of topic um, and using sort of illustrative cases to help you uh, get a framework for understanding the peripheral nervous system its pathology and getting you through essentially your shelf USMLE and real life patients here is in the outline, so we'll just review the PNS, a little bit of transmission disorders, neuromuscular junction transmission disorders, and then the myopathies. Now, this will look uh, exactly like it did during the uh, neuropathies lecture, but just to very quickly review, what is the PNS? So where are we? This is overall a giant topic with thousands of disorders. Yep. So, uh, 200 uh, in the place of thousands last time, but it's essentially, it's giant. It's grown. It's grown. In the last, in the yeah. last <laughs> since we went out and got a cup of coffee, <laughs> it's got 200 plus. Too hard. It depends on how you depends on how you break it down, but basically it's gigantic. Yeah. Right? Uh, the overall, I would say the PNS is elegant. Uh, it's complicated, and yet I also think it's somewhat quite simple when you sort of break it down into into its component parts. So hopefully our students will forgive us that we only have 27 slides instead of a thousand slides. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so anatomically, we have four parts. Again, this is just review, but you have the neurons, be they motor or sensory. Right here. Mm -hmm. Sensory, again, dorsal root, uh, motor, ventral root. Mm -hmm. You have your peripheral nerves, which consist of the roots, the plexus, and the nerves themselves. All right. Then you have the neuromuscular junction, and then you finally have the muscles. And that's it. And we are down near the end of the neuromuscular junction and the muscles today. Again, this will look uh, very similar from your last lecture. So key, uh, key pathology principles, principles when we're talking about the peripheral nervous system. A, uh, the pathology follows from the anatomy. Diseases generally affect either the CNS or the PNS. So you're going to see lots of just peripheral nerve stuff happening in what we're talking about, not really any central nervous stuff. Nerves, again, there's only four possible pathological responses to an insult. You can have a neuronopathy segmental demyelination of the nerve, axonal degeneration, or axonal interruption. We kind of covered that before. Yep. Getting to the meat of what we want to talk about, the neuromuscular junction, there's only pre- and postsynaptic parts to the neuromuscular junction, so there's only pre- and postsynaptic pathology possible. Muscles gets complicated, but they're generally diffuse because you have muscles all over your body. Can we talk just for a second? I want to bring Dr. Sit into this. Can yeah. we talk about general principles <clears throat> in terms of what weakness looks like, yeah. neuropathy, versus myopathy. Yeah, so I would uh, point out two things. Uh, number one, uh, myopathies tend to be proximal weakness, so sh shoulder girdle and hip girdle. Where the big muscles are. Yeah, where the big muscles are, in right. fact. Uh, whereas uh, uh, nerve weakness, uh, uh, neuropathy weakness tends to be more distal, so uh, the uh, distal parts of your hands and feet. Um, the second thing I would point out is that muscle disease will never have any sensory symptoms. Neuromuscular junction will never have any uh, sensory symptoms because it's got nothing to do with sensation. Neuropathies can. So those would be the two things. That makes sense. I like thinking about it. Uh, the myopathies present proximally because that's where the big muscles are, and neuropathies present distally because that's, how f that's the yeah. farthest distance they have to travel, and the, yeah. the farther you go, the more vulnerable they are. Mm -hmm. So here's sort of an outline of what we're going to talk about. So again, with uh, neuromuscular uh, junction, <coughs> you have your pre- and postsynaptic uh, components, and so that pathology in either place can give you a problem with transmission. 
with myopathy, is, this is sort of my breakdown and sort of the way that I think about it, because I think it's very, it's a very large, diffuse, and difficult topic. Um, but three main things we care about. So early progressive myopathies, these are nodular dystrophies. Early static, uh, which are the sort of congenital issues. And then late, and when I say early and late here, I mean presenting. So late progressive, otherwise known as the acquired myopathy. Here is a picture of the neuromuscular junction. Um, here is the presynaptic neuron. Here is uh, the synapse. The receptors that re for uh, activating um, muscle activity, this requires acetylcholine. Um, and uh, so acetyl acetylcholine is, is seen in, in numerous paralytic agents, uh, as we talked about in Brain Pods 2 with Dr. Nelson. Uh, whether or not they are polarizing or depolarizing, they're seen in. Um, uh, poisons, they're seen in botulism, they're seen in uh, black widow spider toxin, mm -hmm. which is, uh, and just for demonstration, we have a black widow spider to put <laughs> <No>. on. <laughs> Jack or Sid? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I want to get paid extra. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. That would be, that would be all out. There's a limit to how far Dr. Sid is willing to go for medical. we're laughing out loud. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you just need to be more committed to medical education. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here is, um, but here are the big um, uh, pre- and post-synaptic disorders. I think if you know these three, you're doing very well. Uh, botulism uh, is, is, is a quite common cause of infant mortality uh, in developing uh, countries. Uh, it, is, um, it is a toxin that's seen in the soil. Um, it is, it, it, we have a picture of it uh, in a moment. Uh, but in addition to that, there's uh, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, uh, which is a, a perineoplastic disorder uh, affecting the presynaptic junction, which we will uh, and talk, uh, also talk about in a moment. And then finally, uh, the big one, which is the postsynaptic myasthenic gra myasthenia gravis. Uh, botulism um, is um, is a common cause of infant mortality, as I just mentioned. It is also commonly, uh, what do you want to say, iatrogenically induced with the uh, Botox. Uh, yeah, it, it it's works. the same toxin. It's the same, it's very similar toxin, the same. Uh, both uh, cosmetically as well as used uh, yeah. therapeutically in dystonic disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, it is as the acetylcholine is, here's a picture of it which you do not need to memorize uh, the details of, but the acetylcholine comes down into the synapse Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in a vesicle, and mm -hmm. it needs to fuse with the membrane yeah. to go into the cleft. Mm -hmm. And the the proteins that take the vesicle and fuse it to the post, pre, I'm sorry, presynaptic membrane are yeah. snare and snap proteins, and botulism blocks mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So the receptors on the nerve, or I'm sorry, the receptors on the muscle, they're fine in yep. botulism. It's the inability to get acetylcholine into that neuromuscular junction in the first place. Yep. And the, that causes weakness. Of which the receptors are the nicotinic receptors. Um, but as Dr. Sitt mentioned, not important in botulinum. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about the other presynaptic uh, neuromuscular junction disorder, uh, Lambert-Eaton syndrome. All right, so again, a little louder. Presynaptic. Uh, the way that these patients sort of typically present, you'll see proximal leg weakness that spares the eyes. You can also see ptosis and diplopia. You'll see uh, possibly absent cranial nerve reflexes. And the big thing here, the thing that sort of distinguishes this, and is always something you have to think about if somebody's giving you this story, is that the weakness will improve with exercise. It's actually something you can, you can see on the, the EMG. Uh, there's a very high association with small cell lung cancer, and the, the treatment for this is really to go after what is sort of underlying the, uh, the body's response and uh, an attack of itself, and that's tumor removal. Right, so, the, so the, the problem here is you have a malignancy, your immune system is responding to that malignancy, and the, the, what is it, the epitope yeah. on the tumor is yeah. very similar to the presynaptic channel, yeah. so that it can't normally depolarize. Did I get that? Yep. Did I get that right? Yep. Um, Dr. Sit, very simple summary. What is repetitive nerve stimulation, okay. and what, is, what, what are we picking up here versus... Right. And the, the main thing is used to pick up, is this a pre versus post synaptic syndrome, right? Okay. So I think it's useful to, 
um, look at the nerve conduction studies in neuromuscular junction just because it tells you a little bit about what's happening clinically too, not just on the test and at the EMG. So each of these waveforms represents a small electric shock stimulating the nerve, or I'm sorry, stimulating the, uh, the muscle. Um, so each time that you the shock comes, the muscle activates the exact same amount because you're stimulating the exact same place. In myasthenia gravis, which we'll talk about in a little bit, because there's a problem with the a postsynaptic uh, part of the junction, uh, the response gets less and less and less and less. And the way you remember this is that, as we'll see in a future slide, patients with myasthenia gravis get fatigable weakness. So at the beginning of the day, it's okay, but then it gets worse as the day goes on. It's okay at the beginning of the exercise, it gets worse as the exercise goes on. Lambert Eaton, you're seeing the exact opposite uh, situation, that as you stimulate more and more, just like a patient can exercise and get some strength back temporarily, you see the uh, motor response get bigger and bigger. Oops, I moved this picture. That's all right. But, um, but that's the general idea. That's the general idea. Um, postsynaptic, think fatigable weakness. So I was doing great in the morning. Mm -hmm. By the evening, I was in much worse shape. And here, we're seeing fatigable weakness, not just by beginning and end of the day, but even uh, second to second or minute to minute. So we ask this patient, uh, I presume someone asked this patient to look up, yep. and for the first few seconds, they're fine, but maybe 10 seconds goes by, th uh, 60 seconds goes by, and this eyelid is now drooping. This is ptosis, and uh, this eye, if, if we were able to see it better, we might see that it's actually going off to the side a little bit, but mostly what we're seeing here is, is fatigable ptosis. If you see fatigable on the exam, and again, it's not if you see it, it's how many times, um, think uh, neuromuscular junction, think myasthenia gravis. So when you are examining someone and you're looking for myasthenia, how long do you have them look up? I have them look up for 60 seconds. Yeah, which is like, which actually is, you know, if if your neuromuscular junction junctions are working well is easy. Yeah. If it's not, there is a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, tell us about myasthenia, Dr. Asadi. All right, so again, just to uh, just sort of recap, so it's postsynaptic. Again, we're talking about something that's autoimmune. Here the antibodies are against the acetylcholine receptor on the postsynaptic part of the membrane. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Yes. Uh, again, it's fluctuating, fatigable weakness, so it's worse with exercise, it's worse at the end of the day. The, I think, very, very common vignette is, you know, somebody has droopy eyelids, they're just, they're just totally out of it at the end of the day. Uh, diagnosis uh, is acetylcholine receptor antibody testing and you always are going to want to do a chest x-ray because there's a high association of this disorder with thymoma and you'll also do an EMG which uh, Dr. Sid uh, described. Yep. All right. So just that... A quick sec um, I'm sorry, just I, we threw in an extra slide there. Did we have anything on... Yes, let's talk about, let's talk about treatment. Uh, there we go. So uh, as far as treatment of myasthenia gravis, uh, and again, uh, as with the uh, with the Guillain-Barre, you are, I think, fairly certain to see one of these patients over your, yeah, your time on the inpatient. It's it's not uncommon. Right. Uh, there's sort of an acute exacerbation treatment, and then there's the, the chronic long-term treatment. So in the acute setting, so these people can have uh, sort of a, a an acute worsening, a sudden worsening of their disorder. Uh, the first thing you always have to know about and, and go looking for is how is their breathing doing? Because that's the thing that will kill them if you're not if you're not paying attention. Which we should remi be reminded that's where the name comes from. It's a grave yeah. disease without without medical treatment. This, mm -hmm. There's a very high mortality to that's this right. condition. Mm -hmm. So the the ways that we do that, the ways that you'll see us do that, is there's what's called the single breath count test. So you have a person take a big breath and then they count in a normal. Manner, as 1, 2, as 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 112, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, uh, they also options are plasmapheresis or IVIG in the right setting. Chronically, uh, essentially you have acetylcholine esterase inhibitors and immunomodulating agents. The big one is pyridostigmine, but I should know that that really is symptomatic treatment only. Some of these patients might end up on chronic steroids, and then sort of steroids uh, sparing agents, non-steroidal immunosuppressants are azathioprine, mycophenolate, 
There's giant lists out there. I think you have yep. to Google yeah. them, but those are the ones I see at least used most commonly. Uh, and just a biopharmacology review. So uh, acetylcholinesterase is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. This is a problem where there is not enough acetylcholine activation mm -hmm. uh, because there's the receptors are all blocked. So what you do is you increase, you can increase the substrate of acetylcholine uh, to activate, you know, to, to more robustly activate the receptors you do have by interfering with acetylcholine's metabolism. That's how, that's how acetylcholinesterase uh, inhibitors, paratostigmine, works. One thing that I it took me, um, uh, one thing about myasthenia gravis, you would think that because there, every muscle has acetylcholine receptors, that every muscle would be equally affected. But what you should really be looking for in your physical exam and on your tests are muscles involving the face. So uh, common symptoms will be ptosis, diplopia, it doesn't take much, even a 1% change, a 5% change in eye muscles, suddenly you have disconjugate gaze. So ptosis, diplopia, chewing problems, swallowing problems, uh, speech problems. Who, let's talk about who gets uh, myasthenia. So myasthenia gravis, it, it tends to occur, um, it's one of those conditions where that affects uh, younger adults and then uh, older adults. So it's, bim most. it's bimodal. Yeah. And I tend to think of it as young women yeah. and older men. Yeah. In general. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, younger women tend to have, are more likely to have autoimmune conditions, not yeah. just, and myasthenia is an autoimmune condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and younger women tend to have a better course. If it's, if, if an, if an older male gets yeah. it, they usually tend to have a more aggressive course. Yep. Um, uh, but to be treated, so when these people, uh, just another kind of comment. So this is, this is a chronic disorder. Uh, they can be well treated and yeah. then have an exacerbation and infection. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, being placed on the wrong medication, which yeah. interferes um, with their neuromuscular junction. A lot of antibiotics can do this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this the, the list is long, um, and it, and they they come in and the you 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 essentially treat them. You you treat them like it's an immunological attack. You, you yeah. give them immunosuppressive agents. Yeah. Uh, and these people can go from looking quite good yeah. to respiratory failure fairly quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to say just one thing, not just because it may help the NHS, but it may save a life. So if a person comes in, whether it's neuromuscular weakness from myasthenia gravis or ALS or whatever it is causing respiratory failure, the common instinct that a, a physician might have is, I need to give this person oxygen. I need to start them on oxygen. Yeah. That could be the thing that, unfortunately, it could end a person's life because the problem is not the lungs. The problem is not oxygen. The problem yeah. is the bellows moving the air in and out. And if you start giving someone oxygen without any ventilatory support, um, you take away their uh, hypoxic drive to breathe, and it can make it worse. Because they're, cause they're becoming hypercarbic because yeah. they're, not exp they're not exhaling uh, carbon dioxide. Um, okay, I think that's that's myasthenia. Uh, here was uh, just now that we've moved past the uh, neuromuscular junction, we are now on to uh, disorders of the muscle itself. All right. So just a few introductory words. So you have about uh, 600 muscles in your body. Each muscle is composed of thousands of fibers. Each fiber is innervated by a nerve twig of a motor neuron. And again, to review, the motor unit is the motor neuron plus all the fibers it innervates on the muscles themselves. Uh, muscle responses to injury are also uh, fairly simple, maybe a little bit more complicated than the nerve, but you're either going to get muscle fiber necrosis, uh, collagen and fat depositions, we call vacuolation, which is accumulation of various deposits, glycogen, lipids, so on and so forth, uh, ultimately regeneration, hopefully, and uh, sometimes hypertrophy. And here are just a few slides of, um, of that muscle pathology. Uh, Dr. Sid, can you just kind of summarize just a little yeah, briefly I, on what we're talking about? I don't, I don't want to dwell on this too long, but uh, I, I think it's really interesting. So this is what normal muscle looks like. Each of these um, polygons is an individual muscle fiber. Um, the nuclei are supposed to be on the edges. Um, it's a nice, uh, healthy uh, red color. Um, when you get over to, uh, let's go down here first. So you see all these angry uh, purple cells. These are all inflammatory cells. So this would be something that you could see in one of the inflammatory muscle disorders that we'll uh, talk about in a second. The Particularly poly, yeah. this is polymyositis, in fact. Um, in these two, um, 
these are non-specific but end muscle kind of changes. So whether it's a person's had inflammation for a long time or they have a muscular dystrophy more commonly, you start to see uh, uh, muscle fibers get replaced by collagen. See how thick those pink stripes are in the middle and fat replacement and the nuclei start mo uh, moving in towards the middle of the cell. It's just something we see. So normal, oops, what the love went down. <laughs> normal, <laughs> dystrophy, inflammation. All right, thank you. All right. All right, so further the, uh, just going a little bit further, what might you see on uh, an examination of a person who, who may be showing uh, a myopathy? So their mental status. So these people, it, it's muscle, right? So you shouldn't see anything really wrong in terms of their mental status. They should be, they should be overall uh, normal in that regard. Cranial nerves are usually normal. However, you might see overall facial weakness, dysarthria, dysphagia. Um, the, when you get to the motor exam, so again, because you have muscles everywhere, so you would more likely than not see sort of a symmetric uh, and again, more proximal weakness because those, those are where the, the larger muscles are. Reflexes could be normal, but otherwise decreased, right? Because you have the, the last part of the reflex arc is now, uh, has some sort of pathology. Sensory should be normal. You should never, uh, to reflect what Dr. Sid mentioned before, you should never have a sensory issue. Coordination should largely be normal. Gait is uh, quite variable because lots of muscles are involved in producing a normal gait. And you might see waddling. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's a classic sign called a Gower's maneuver. Do we, I think we get to that later, right? Of what, yeah. Right. While you're uh, thinking about myopathies and you're working this patient up, so a big uh, couple of like special labs that you're gonna do because they're, they're relevant to the muscles, uh, creatine kinase, uh, uh, lactate dehydrogenase, and then depending on what you're thinking, you might do genetic analysis. Um, I would leave that statement there because that, every time I've sort of tried to review that, I think it grows by leaps and bounds. Yeah. Um, yeah. More and more tests every month, it seems. Uh, the other thing that you're always gonna be thinking about is nerve conduction studies or EMG, and then uh, in certain cases, probably a lot of cases, you're gonna end up biopsying the muscle itself. And as we talked about a little bit in the last uh, brain pod, Dr. Sit kind of gave us a review of, of nerve conduction study and EMG. This is, when you're talking about muscle, that's where the EMG really comes in handy, yeah. right? That's where you're putting yeah. a needle, you gotta put a needle in the muscle, you, uh, you look at it when it's resting, yeah. as well as when it's activated, yeah. and you yeah. look at interesting kind of phenomena that arise from that study. So getting uh, to some of the, the, the myopathies themselves. So the first sort of grouping is the what we call the early progressive uh, group. This is the, your dystrophies. So these start early in life and they worsen. So that's what, I, that's what we're referring to here by early and progressive. Um, they are typically uh, genetic. They're caused by mutations that essentially alter structure, uh, the structural part of a, uh, of a protein and its function or the, the enzymatic processes that it might be undergoing or undergo itself. Yeah, the, the process, as, as we remember from histology, the process by which muscle contracts is, is needless to say, very, very complicated. Yes. And if there is some abnormality in the scaffolding of that contraction, yep. that manifests itself in a different type of um, muscular dystrophy, whether or not that's Duchenne's, just yeah. a couple of names that I don't think you need to master, but just limb yeah. girdle muscular distal, yeah. dystrophy, facial scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy, myotonic dystrophy, mm -hmm. um, all of those are related to some degree of impairment of the contraction of the muscle yeah. or the, ac the activation of it. Mm -hmm. um, Here's sort of an illustrative case, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get a little bit into the Gower sign. So you have a 13-year-old boy, uh, started having difficulty with walking and rising from the floor at age five. By nine, he required a wheelchair, so you see sort of there's a progressive nature to this. He's worsening. He has an older brother who is also affected uh, and also has congestive heart failure. That's something key to sort of point out there. And when you examine this person, uh, you have essentially four out of five proximal symmetric weakness in the arms, three out of five proximal symmetric weakness in his legs with a sort of remaining uh, neurological exam. And then the CK, the creatinine kinase, is in the thousands, which is abnormal. And uh, anything the, more than 250 to 300 is abnormal. Yeah. 
And when you ask this patient to uh, say, get up, if you, if you sit him down on the floor and you ask him to get up, there's this very stereotyped uh, thing called a Gower sign. So they don't have the, if, if you don't have your proximal muscles uh, sort of intact and healthy, you don't really have the strength to, to, to rise in, in, in a, what we would call a normal fashion. So you sort of have to push yourself up by uh, almost doing like a, I mean, it's almost like a yoga pose. The way it's, it's kind of the way that I remember it. And so you're, you're, sure. you're separating your legs here a little bit and then sort of pushing yourself upright instead of just uh, flexing and then extending your, your, your lower extremity. So this is a classic test for um, a particular Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which is where it was originally described. But you'll see this in adults, too, who they'll be in a chair, and instead of just getting up normally, yeah. they have to put their hands down on their legs and then sit up and then mm -hmm. stand up like so. Yeah. Which is which is it's the hip muscles. It's the hip muscles which are weak, so they have to kind of brace themselves with their arms and, and lean forward in order to stand up. So, where all that was leading is we have a, that was a patient with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy who had the positive Gower signs. So, things that you might have taken uh, or that we can take from that little vignette. So, this is an excellent recessive disorder. It's a mutation in the gene dystrophin. Uh, these patients essentially have. Uh, look normal at birth, but then difficulty walking starts in their uh, toddler years, essentially age two to six. Cardiac uh, abnormalities are the big thing. Yep. Uh, also respiratory, but cardiac is really the, the big one, and it leads to uh, essentially an early death in the patient's 20s. Uh, on exam, in addition to the proximal weakness that uh, we're sort of showing with, uh, in that patient it was the, the proximal arms, proximal legs, and the Gower sign. You might also see calf pseudohypertrophy, excuse me. These people have really thick calves. Uh, it's quite striking when you when you see a patient uh, up close. What do they What do they feel like though? When you when you you know you know they, they don't feel like typical strong muscular calves. They're kind of floppy. Am I right about that? Yeah, and kind of kind of rubbery. And and the the thing is that's why uh, the, the, it's called muscular dystrophy. It's not about muscles okay. just getting smaller. Uh, in some cases, they actually appear bigger, but it's not smaller, it's dysfunctional. It's not strong. They're not strong muscles. Mm -hmm. yep. So when you're working this up, so labs, you'll see an elevated CK like we saw in that patient with uh, it going up to the 3000s. You, if, you did June stu if you did gene studies, you'll hopefully find the genetic mutation. And then if you do the biopsy, you can do uh, immunohistochemistry and show some of what uh, Dr. Sid was showing in the, yeah. the slide a few slides back. Treatment uh, can involve steroids to sort of tamper down the process, but otherwise it's largely supportive. How, why do, you know, so this is an inherited non-inflammatory disorder. Why would steroids help? I, I have no idea. I don't think they fully understand. We have strong data that use of prednisone in patients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, it can improve outcomes in terms of heart muscle function and breathing muscle function. Because yeah. unfortunately for these patients, as uh, Dr. Seddon pointed out, they're affected. Um, is there an effect for the skeletal muscles too? Maybe, but why does it work? Uh, I don't know. But this is, Duchenne's I believe is the most common muscular dy dystrophy. Yes. Am I right about that? Yep. yep. Okay. Related in part to Becker's muscular dystrophy. Yep. So this is sort of a, I have always thought about it as just a less severe form. Instead of having essentially yeah. non-functional dystrophy, you have a semi-functional one, and so you have <clears throat> some function. Yeah. Uh, so same idea in terms of, 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 of presentation, but it's overall less severe. These patients walk into their 30s. They don't have uh, as much early uh, death. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of exciting area, a lot of exciting gene therapy trials ongoing for pretty much all of the disorders we've mentioned. Um, someone is at least trying to figure out gene therapy that'll work. Um, the, the most exciting was uh, nusinersen for spinal muscular atrophy, as we talked about last time. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, effective gene therapy for Duchenne's, uh, not quite as dramatic, unfortunately, as uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, it is, again, an antisense oligonucleotide, uh, and it, it improves that uh, absent, it, it, it creates semi-functional, not completely functional, uh, dystrophin protein. And, and the individuals with Duchenne's uh, don't have any uh, good dystrophin protein. Uh, those with Becker's have semi-functional protein. So in practical effect, Dr. Sid, I appreciate how you describe this, is it, is it takes someone with Duchenne's and kind of turns them into someone with Becker's. Is yeah. that that's a fair way to look at it? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
moving on to uh, inflammatory, clearly inflammatory diseases of the muscle. Yeah. So these uh, we filed under sort of late progressive, so they happen later in life, and then they do they do worsen, which means they're technically acquired. So the two big ones are polymyositis and dermatomyositis. Polymyositis is a cell mediated process. It's going to happen uh, after age twenty. Um, you're going to see again symmetric muscle weakness and then a whole host of uh, systemic disease. So arthralgias, uh, cardiac induction deficits, arrhythmias, you can have uh, associated interstitial lung disease. Uh, it's, it, the idea and the way that I think about it is you have a whole lot going on, plus you have a muscle disease. And so that should tell you that there's, yeah. that there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a diffuse process happening. Treatment is with steroids and uh, IVIG or plasmapheresis. And then the related one is dermatomyositis, which is humorally affected, uh, affects children and adults more, um, uh, or children plus adults, not just uh, later onset. And the way that I sort of oversimplistically think about it is it's polymyositis plus a rash. So these people should have uh, a rash somewhere. The other sort of main difference, though, is that this is associated very, very strongly with malignancy. You always have to go after the potential for them to have a malignancy. Yep. And, and treatment is, again, steroids uh, and uh, avoidance of sun exposure, so, not, not so, sun exposure. So you don't promote sun exposure, it's avoidance of sun exposure. And Got so it. The, and just to <laughs> hammer on, again, the, symmetri or the, uh, the, the systemic stuff is basically the same between polymyositis and that. We're going to talk about one other uh, uh, myositis here in a second, but just to uh, take a look at the, the classic biopsy uh, findings. Is, so they have a, they, these um, both have inflammatory... Uh, infiltrates. Interestingly, the py polymyositis tends to be uh, this uh, endomesial um, uh, inflammation, while the dermatomyositis tends to be uh, perivascular. Um, I don't, I don't have much more to add on on the biopsy yeah. findings. Any th other thoughts, Doctor Um, uh, yeah. So I guess the the one thing that I would say, not just with biopsy, but with muscle disease, if you meet a patient with progressive proximal weakness over weeks or months, you need to solve the puzzle. If not everyone listening to this podcast is necessarily going to go into neuromuscular medicine. Right, right. And if, and if uh, a person, you know, is not able to make the diagnosis of a rare form of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. That's fine. So it That's goes. It's, it's not great, but so it goes. You can only, uh, there's only so much that, you know, you can study at once. But if you meet someone with new progressive proximal weakness, you have to solve the puzzle because it's probably treatable. Some of these genetic forms of muscular dystrophy, they have different patterns. We're not going to get into that. If you meet someone with proximal weakness, it gets worse. You need to figure out what's going on. It could be inflammation. It could be toxic from something like statins. It could be something else treatable. Well, let's talk about statins. That's, that's really important. So statins, cholesterol lowering agents, simvastatin, yeah. uh, atorvastatin, mm -hmm. creates kind of a picture similar to this, right? Yes. Pro progressive weakness, Inflammatory, it hurts. You squeeze their muscle; yeah. they're in pain. They have an yeah. elevated CK. Yep. Number um, one cause of primary muscle disease in uh, middle-aged adults it starts in middle-aged adults. So statin, toxic mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, uh, myositis. Okay, yes. got it. Uh, did you want you you wanted to mention one other one? So yeah. there's polymyositis, dermatomyositis. And there's often a third myositis yeah. included in there. Yeah, and uh, so there's a third inflammatory muscle disease that you should probably know about called inclusion body myositis. It doesn't fit the pattern of the other inflammatory diseases in a couple ways. Number one, it doesn't cause proximal weakness. It causes more quadricep weakness and finger flexors. And number two, unfortunately, at least as of the recording of this video, uh, we don't possess a treatment. Now you might be saying, well, why are you making me learn this <laughs> disorder? Like, I'm trying, I'm not trying to learn everything. You're getting into minutia. Well, because IBM is the second most common cause of primary muscle disease in middle-aged uh, adults. So, um, unfortunately, you know, the, this disorder didn't read our books, and it, okay. it follows a different pattern, but just so you're aware of it. All right. Great. Well, okay. thank you. That We knocked that one out. Uh, that was nice. Um, so that was all of, uh, in the last two podcasts, we did all of uh, peripheral neurology. 
Uh, many of our, our teachers and mentors are rolling over in their grave that we didn't spend eight hours on this. Uh, <laughs> but we locked them outside of the door. We locked, we locked the door. them outside of the door right now. I'd be in trouble. Uh, all right, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sip, for joining us. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, next time on Brain Pods, Dr. Asadi is going to be back, and he is uh, going to talk about uh, stroke and uh, cerebral vascular disease. All right.